This week on the big show, Black Music Month continues and we'll spotlight the iconic career of trailblazing Quincy Jones. Plus there's several movies in theaters uh, and we'll kind of discuss them all, including the animated film Luca, the documentary Rita Moreno, Just the Girl Who Decided to Go For It, the hitman's bodyguard's wife, or is the hitman's wife's bodyguard? Man, I got to work on your title game, and it ain't me. We'll, we'll go into that a little bit later on. And Kevin Hart's uh, latest film, Fatherhood. Uh, new CCA member Charles Kirkland Jr. will join me to discuss these and other issues in the entertainment industry on this special, look behind me, Juneteenth episode episode 459 of Keeping It Real with Film Gordon. Let's go. All right, welcome to the Juneteenth edition of the big show, Keeping It Real with Film Gordon. I am Tim Gordon. I'm not even going to tell you that as a rule, you know, we normally do our shows when there's light outside. We flip the script tonight because it's Freedom Weekend. It's Juneteenth. Um, to be perfectly honest, um, I'm, I'm, I'm having fun because I've been struggling all day with, you know, in 2021, how do we commemorate Juneteenth? Charles Kirkland, welcome to the show. Um, I'm not sure if you've been thinking about this at all today. You know, whenever we, we have national or federal holidays, you know, like we think about the King holiday, we think about, you know, President's Day, we think about you know, some of the other holidays, Labor Day, Memorial Day, we, we usually have a built-in purpose, whether it's honoring military veterans, whether it's, you know, saluting civil rights icons uh, with National and Indigenous Day now. Of course, we've changed that from when we were both young, when it was Columbus Day. Um, but, you know, Juneteenth is an interesting, an interesting observation for me. Um, thoughts before we get started. Thoughts. Uh, you, you know, this is kind of crazy because although some states were already celebrating Juneteenth, it really seemed like this federal holiday just is like dropped on us all of a sudden out of nowhere, which I'm not, you know, I'm not complaining about it, but it's just that it's kind of odd that all of a sudden on Wednesday, there was no holiday and now there is one. And so people are taking off and I mean, it's a total federal holiday. Uh, so my question is actually, there are some, you know, when the slaves were freed back in 19, uh, 18, 1865. 1865. You know, <laughs> no, in 1863, but I'm saying Juneteenth is based on 1865. Right. It took two years for uh, the word to get all the way out, which is why we celebrate Juneteenth. How long is it going to take for this holiday to get all the way around the United States? Because really, even Martin Luther King holiday wasn't celebrated everywhere for quite some time. So I, I want to see how states are going to respond to this federal holiday. Well, I think the thing that's interesting, and I was struggling with this last week as we were, I was thinking about what we would do this weekend program, programmatically for our show. And when you think about Juneteenth, you know, it's no, no uh, coincidence that I'm wearing the underground shirt, which, of course, was the, the show that ran for two seasons on. Um, I can't remember what the name of that network was because um, it wasn't a major network. It was a small WGN. network. WGN. WGN. Thank you. And of course, underground was a story of uh, a group of, of slaves and their journey to get to the Underground Railroad and get to freedom. And when I think about Juneteenth, you know, we've been doing shows or talking all throughout the pandemic, you know, starting with all of the, the racial reckoning of last summer, you know, which came to a head with George Floyd, among other folks uh, last year, a whole host of other people who, who lost their lives in these sorts of encounters. And, you know, we kept talking about black trauma. We've done several shows this year where we talk about finding black joy, et cetera. And now you have a holiday that celebrates uh, the news of slaves being freed. And I was, I was having a conversation with a colleague earlier today. I said, you know, 
Um, I'm not being funny, but it sort of takes us right back there again, because in order to celebrate this holiday, we've had to be in captivity and then we're free. So I said, um, that's why I said I've been struggling with how do you commemorate uh, this holiday doing what we do? Like, you know, with music, I guess you could make some playlists and you could kind of find some music that talks about freedom and, you know, finding that space of freedom um, with films. You know, I guess there there's some stories, but in order to get to the freedom and cinematically, you're going to have to go through something <laughs> to get to the other side. So I'm like, oh, well, so that's just these are just my thoughts. I can be wrong. I'm in the moment. We're in our initial. Well, actually, when I say our initial, uh, we're in the first of the federal holiday of Juneteenth. And I think there's a lot of discussion that's going to be going on around households around the country, predominantly of African-Americans in discussing what I'm talking about right now. And Charles has probably has his discussion as well. So um, so we're going to make a pivot and go to show right now. Um, Wilson Morales, who normally joins us, wasn't on our show last week. He's not going to be on our show this week. Talked to Wilson earlier tonight. Wilson has been covering Tribeca, which is in its final weekend, so he will not be here today. He, he found some much cooler people, celebrities, open bars, food. They're just plying. They're feeding Wilson. He's watching premieres. He's doing what any of us would do at a film festival, and I guess this is the first opening or the first big event that's happening in New York right now. So Wilson was like, I'm going to check y'all guys out next week, man. You can miss me right now. Um, The second big news of the day um, is going to actually happen tomorrow. We did, we announced the nominations for the fifth annual black real awards for television last night. And um, to say that um, social media really took to what we did last night would be an understatement. Um, I'll share with Charles a little later on uh, off air what the the impressions ended up at. Um, Cordell Martin is going to join me tomorrow. And Charles, you're invited if you want to do it tomorrow uh, to talk about the Black Real Awards um, for television, which I think is shaping up to be, you know, I don't know, man. I mean, every year I talk about how competitive races are you know we had you know we talked earlier this year when we did the black real awards back in april uh the film awards of we had several categories that were these really back-breaking categories outstanding actress um was was the one that comes to mind where you had five heavyweights um just think of that and then you think of the black real awards for television which as i said we will discuss tomorrow on another show uh, where you have an entire you have entire fields like the whole drama category is just nuts. Uh, the comedy categories are amazing. They really are. I mean, I, I as a as the the founder of all of this, am 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 deeply humbled looking at just how far we've come in twenty years. And what I mean by that, if you don't believe me, you go back to two thousand and say, let's say two thousand two thousand five. And just look at the output of of African-Americans and creatives who now we had people, for the most part, who've always starred in films. Right. There's always been a Halle Berry, a Denzel Washington, a Sanaa Lathan, Derek Luke, Jamie Foxx, Don Cheadle. There was always a bunch of good actors that were out there. The biggest difference, Charles, and if you don't believe me, like I said, again, check it out for yourself is in the difference of the creatives now who are who are showrunners and and streaming companies or streaming services and network uh shows uh the executive producers directors um i mean you know there was once upon a time when it was gina prince bythewood there was spike lee um i'm trying to think who else was prominent during that time i'm talking about the early 2000s you know you have melvin van people i mean mario van people that was still making movies with badass but there i mean we had a a group of african-american directors but nothing like what we're looking at right now it's just been from 2000 i would say about 2000 maybe 13 14 to now wow Explosion. explosion Yeah, man, it it is it has been it has been something to see. 
And you will see that reflected in the Black Reel Awards for television, which incidentally, Charles, didn't exist until 2017. And I give Cordell Martin a lot of credit because he came to me uh, in 2016, like in September. I never forget it. He called me one night. He's like, I think it's time for us to do a TV award. And I said, really? I mean, you know, because for years I was like, is there going to be enough in order for us to do this? And he said, I'll get back to you. And the next day he came back and gave me a 10 page spreadsheet of shows that he <laughs> looked at. And I said, well, I guess, I guess there is enough to do it. And the rest they say is history. So, you know, we've had the, the This Is Us years, the Queen Sugar, Black Lightning. I mean, we've seen the rise of television. And the thing that I, and I'll leave it alone. This is my last one and I'll save the, re the rest of this for tomorrow is the thing that I think is interesting about television that's very different from movies is that movies we know are kind of one-offs, which basically means that we'll see Black Panther in 2018, and then you know we'll have to wait either for a sequel or there'll be another set of films the following year. The thing that makes television engaging to me is that their shows, and I talked about This Is Us or Queen Sugar, where these shows are going in the year four, five, six, but, Despite the fact that these shows have that there's these shows that have these multiple seasons, there's always a new crop of what I call freshman shows that come up. And then we had the year, the rise of shows like um, For Life, All Rise, and all of these other shows that came out of nowhere. And it's always interesting because despite the fact that you've got regulars, you know, just think Insecure is going to be going into its final year a little later on. We haven't seen Atlanta in two years. And, and those two shows used to dominate the comedy categories. So the, the, the fact that we see stuff that's somewhat familiar, but it sort of changes. And there's a little bit of the old and the new every year in television, which is a lot different from what we see with actors who may show up every year, but in different films, it just makes it a very compelling a program to look at and analyze every every year charles i think the the biggest thing the biggest contributor to the explosion that we're seeing in television is that there are so many more outlets now where where things can be seen before you we locked into to the the big three maybe four and had to fight for a space in there but now We've got our own networks. We've got uh, lots of locations where we can put things out for people to see. And thankfully, people are checking it out. I mean, sure, we have This Is Us on NBC, but uh, you mentioned Underground is on WGN. Who knew, who knew about WGN until, uh, I mean, it was there as a Chicago network, but I mean, people, people weren't really watching WGN. Uh, you got uh, the own network. You've got you've got uh, uh, all these areas where we, you can go and see any um, any amount of African American centered programming, and which is beautiful. Which is beautiful because it, it it didn't have to exist. It didn't have to succeed, but it is, and it's and it's wonderful. And it's not just because it's ours, but it's our great work that is coming out. And people are are at tuning in because it's quality work to watch right so, I, I definitely agree with you man so yeah i was just thinking about that man because you know i've been immersed in television we you know we're also working on the lakefront film festival <laughs> which is going to launch in a month looking at you know not necessarily looking at movies for that because we've got our lineup of films which uh you know my friend who's who's talking to me is going to take these films and group them together into their different areas but uh, we're talking about uh, the, the, the hunt for the opening, closing, and somewhat spotlight films that we're going to have in this virtual festival. Um, to say, Charles, that I can't wait to get to uh, in-person screenings again and in-person festivals, um, cannot wait. Um, I mean, I love the virtual game. We've been doing it well here for over a year. Uh, but at some point, they're going to call us back and go, y'all got to come into the studio. And uh, I'm like, eh, I don't know, Charles. I'm kind of digging this home thing. <laughs> hey, look, I, I I feel you on the on the on our show, but I'm ready to get back into the theaters. I, I've I've got my first uh, solicitation for a movie theater to see a film in the theater, and and I quickly accepted 
because not just because of what it was, but I I, I need to get back out there. I mean, I, I want to feel the experience of being in the theater again. So All I, right. I'm, I'm not sure about how I feel about somebody sitting right next to me in the theater, but you know, we'll see how that goes when we, when we get there. Cross that bridge when we get to it. All right. We're 16 minutes into this show, and uh, here is the bombshell that uh, I found out about the day. Uh, a couple of days ago, um, the, the Critics' Choice Association, which I've been a member of since 2013, um, we held our elections for the, the board, the new board of directors. Um, so we submitted those ballots, turned them in, and I get a call today from my esteemed colleague, co-host and friend, Charles Kirkland Jr., who told me that as of today, he has received the email that he has now become African-American member number 36 and also number 480 of the, of the most esteemed critics group in the country, the Critics' Choice Association, formerly the Broadcast Film Critics' Association, Charles Kirkland. I will teach you the secret handshake when I see you in person. Welcome to the club. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. It's a I'm, lot of fun. I, I'm, I'm super pumped. You know, I've been working toward this for a, a number of years, and to finally get here, I was sitting in in a restaurant with my family and the, and the text king said, check your email. I checked my email and I just dropped my phone because I was like, yes, praise the Lord. I can't believe it. Thank you, Lord. I'm here. I'm in. And so I sent you that text. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and, I, and I got to be me. I was like, oh, man, what you in the house? What you, what you, what you, what, what you doing? You in? But I, I, I sort of kind of got it. And it is a big deal, man. Um, I just think that um, it, it, it is interesting because for years we would be on these shows and Wilson and I and other members of the CCA would talk and be like, yeah, don't, don't talk to Charles. Charles not in the club. He doesn't really get it. I understand. But I think the thing that's interesting about the Critics' Choice uh, Association in, in the way that it has grown over the last, you know, since I've been there, it's eight years now. Um, it is, um, it, there's a, it's a very interesting group that is going through a transition right now. And this last week uh, with the, the, the election of these new board members, which we will find out next week who, who won these elections with the votes. But there are so many people that um, I have, you know, behind the scenes try to, to prod. We need more membership. So Charles and our good friend Julian Lytle, who's done the show, who's gotten in. Shireen Nicole uh, has recently been admitted in. Uh, May Abdubaki, another person who's done the show. So there's so many of my colleagues who joined the Wilson Morales, the Sean Edwards, the T.D. Stern Enzies, the Kevin Sampson. Kevin got in like about two or three years ago. Right. So there has been a major influx of, of new critics that have come through. And it's going to be very interesting um, what's how this is going to affect everything later on, because basically the, the role that we occupy is that uh, as we get to the end of the year, this, the, the major studios are about trying to get uh, awards recognition for their films. And I, you've heard me say it on this show many times, it's a three-part, it's a three-pronged process, which usually starts off with critics first, and then you get to that first set of votes, which is usually the critics choice, uh, the Golden Globes, and then there's that last leg, which is the Academy Awards. And then you have all the things that happen in between, uh, whether it's SAG, PG, DGA, PGA, um, I, I'm doing a plug for me, Black Real Awards, we in there too, uh, near the finish line. So yeah, man, so, so this is, this is going to be a lot of fun. And of course, Charles has been around me long enough and has listened to many of the members that have come on the show. So you kind of know what to expect that uh, later on this year, man, it gets, it gets hectic, it gets busy. You thought it was busy before. Um, it gets busy. You got to hit the road. You got to go out and do these these junkets. There's a lot of stuff happening uh, toward the end of the year. But, bro, you got to keep on building, man. Congratulations. Um, 
it's long overdue. I'm happy for you. I'm telling you public. I'm telling you publicly what I told you privately. Keep on doing you, bro. Do your thing, man. I just want to thank you, Tim, for the support and the uh, guidance that you've given me. I thank um, Nell Minow. I thank Travis Hobson. I thank all the guys who came before me and show, leading me by the hand through there. But I, I really shout, send a shout out to my friend, uh, Big Mike Bryant, who got me started on this road a long time ago. And uh, it's it's celebration time, it's celebration time. And time to get to work. So Yeah, big time, man. So speaking of getting to work, man, here he, we are. We like 20, 20 some odd minutes in, man. I know we got a lot of movies to cover, man. Um, I'm trying to think. Um. You know, my week, man, it's been, you know, it's been a very interesting uh, period for me right now because, you know, Carl's knows that I'm going through a transition of, you know, professional transition. And I'm still a critic and had been one since 1992, man, but I feel like I'm doing less writing these days because I've got my eye on several other things. Um, and I, and at some point, I think that you know you Charles of course we're doing inside baseball right now because I'm talking in code so Charles knows that once we kind of solidify some of the behind the scenes stuff as it relates to our awards and our film festival that it'll be a lot easier for me and I and I'm targeting like the, the fall like around September that we can put a lot of this stuff behind us and get back to work and get down to a home stretch because this ain't this ain't early this year when we had this 14 month <laughs> film critic year, man. We're going back. The film year ends at the end of December. So it is literally going to be a sprint. And then I think the other part that's very awkward, and you you touched on it earlier, Charles, is the fact that we are going through a reopening and studios now are starting to try to pull back on links to try to force people back into the theater. So um there, there are certain films that still have options um i know one film i took the option i'm like man i'll just watch it at home because the other issue we're dealing with is they're trying to send us i don't know an hour and change out the way to go watch movies until we have theaters opening up closer to where we are so it's a very interesting um transition that's being made right now and you know you doing what you're doing during the day trying to catch movies at night it's tough man i mean you know we had we we had life prior to the pandemic where we kind of understood how it worked then there was the pandemic and then we had to go through figuring out how to navigate in that space and then you get comfortable doing that and they go oh no we need you back doing what you did before so it's like ah now i gotta stop i'm running in this direction oh, i gotta stop again ah turn around again so it's it's a very interesting process man yep yep and oh boy here we go <laughs> here we go man so all right so as we said at the top it's black music month charles is uh you know an associate producer on the show charles throws out the topic he, uh, so who are we saluting this week, Charles Kirkland? We're celebrating the man, the myth, the legend, the one and only Quincy Jones. Quincy Delight Jones. See, you, you see what I did there? I'm not reading anything, man. I know the brother's name is Quincy Delight Jones. Quincy Jones, man, uh, when we do these things, it's always interesting to me because, you know, I think, I think you set me up, Charles, that, you know, you ain't giving me anybody hard. You're always throwing somebody at me um, who is somebody who I, 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 I feel a great deal of respect for. And Quincy Jones is that guy, man. Quincy Delight Jones was born in 1932, and I am going to get some notes because I want to make sure I don't miss anything, was born in 1932 in Chicago, Illinois. And 33. as I say that again, 33, I'm 33. sorry, 33. Um, he is a uh, record producer, musician, songwriter, composer, arranger, and film and television producer. His career spans seven decades, 70 years, uh, with a record 80 Grammy Award nominations, 28 Grammy wins, and a Grammy Legend Award in 1992. Most notably, as a kid, one of his closest friends was none other than Ray Charles. 
when he picked up the trumpet and decided to play, the person that gave him his first jazz lesson was none other than Miles Davis. Um, in his lifetime, he was a band leader along with Count Basie for none other than Frank Sinatra. He's worked with people like Michael Jackson, George Benson. I mean, Quincy Jones. I get, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this, and it, and it, and it sounds very nice, right? I remember, I'll, I'll use this analogy. I remember several years ago, Netflix had a, 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 a documentary called The Black Godfather, which, of course, was about Clarence Avon, who happens to have Quincy Jones as his best friend. Right. And I remember watching that and Charles and I had a conversation and I said, you know, if Clarence Avon was not a real person and that was something you that would be somebody you would invent. I feel the same way about Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones is almost so his career is touches on so many different facets that if he wasn't a real guy, it would almost be like a character you would invent, like a person who has that much reach and it can touch that many people. He was a, I mean, he, think about Quincy Jones's career. Um, he became the most prolific African American, and as a as a film score and composer, he composed scores for thirty four movies in the nineteen sixties. His first movie was The Pawn Broker, right? Think about Quincy Jones, who, for whatever reason, saw this young kid named Michael Jackson. Right now, before he got to Michael Jackson. Quincy Jones had been produced and he had done his own stuff. He had done the score for Sanford and Son. He, he, you know, he did stuff like that in the 70s. You know, for all you people who tease me about age, there's a good thing about age that you you learn something because you live through some stuff. I live through some stuff with a lot of these people. So Quincy Jones is somebody whose career I am intimately kind of uh, associated with. And I remember. George Benson in 1977 or 78 did Breezin, right? You know, uh, this album he did that that was like his jazz breakthrough, right? And he came back the following year and Quincy Jones took him in the studio. And he did an album. Um, I, what was that? I, I'm looking at the album cover, but I know the album has songs like Love Time, Love, um, Moody's Mood. Um, so Quincy Jones produced this album. And to this day, every I mean, it's the it's the most layered George Benson album. If you listen to a song like Love Times Love, there's so much stuff going on underneath what what Benson is doing, you know, with the with the little percussions that they put in there. Q just has an ear of layering and layering and layering. And then by the time he got to Michael Jackson off the wall in 79 and then he does Thriller for Michael Jackson, you're like, my God, wait, hold on a second. I want to get in trouble. Did Q do Off the Wall? Because I know he did Thriller. Did yeah, he do yeah, Off the Wall? He did yeah. Off the Wall. Yes. Okay, I'm just checking because I didn't want the I didn't want the Jacksonites coming for me. <laughs> but but between that and Thriller, Thriller is you know whatever you can call it the largest selling album of all time, second largest. It doesn't really matter. It's sold now. What it, last count? I thought it was. Is it is it over 100, 100 million copies yet? 100 it, million units sold? It is. It is. I think it's closer to 110, but go, I think so, yeah. Yeah, so Q, Q you know, uh, We Are the World <laughs> brought everybody together for that. Uh, <laughs> what has Q not done? Uh, the Color Purple, he's a, a movie producer. What has Q not done? Back on the block, what has Q not done? I mean, from jazz to gospel or rap i mean he worked with the winans he's he's done everything so i mean he's been everywhere and i mean you like you said what has what hasn't what, what has q not done man quincy quincy jones i now it's an interesting thing i met him one time i was at uh working at whur and he had written his autobiography so this had to be mm, i don't know like around oh, 99 2000 something like that and um he came to Howard, Howard University, to do part of his book tour. And I met him, said hello to him. And then the rest of my job was standing next to him as people were coming to sign his book and going, can you pass me another one of Q's books? So, <laughs> you can sign. So, so that's my interaction with Quincy Jones. I'm not trying to make it sound like we sat down and chopped it up. No, we did not. But Quincy Jones is someone, 
you know, I always respect excellence. And the fact that this man has represented excellence for such a long period of time, I mean, what can you say, man? He, you, you talk about Clarence Avon being a guy that broke down doors. It's no accident that the two of these guys are that close as friends because they, their career paths may not have been as, I mean, Avon was not as high profile as Jones was, but as influential as Jones's was. So great guy, Clarence Avon. I mean, Clarence Avon. Well, he is a great guy, but Quincy, but Quincy Jones is who we are discussing right now. So, um, I'm, I'm so glad that Q is still here. Um, a little later on when we start doing reviews, I'm going to talk about another one of my personal heroes who, a, a film that I saw that, and we're going to discuss closely th those lives sort of parallel. So remember that the Clarence Avon Quincy Jones parallel when we go later into the show. So Charles, what do you have about Jones? Anything that you have, you want to bring up about Q? You know, he was just inducted uh, this year to the Black Music and Entertainers Walk of Fame uh, as a foundational inductee to that to that Walk of Fame. Uh, I mean, you can talk about all the awards he's done. I mean, uh, all the soundtracks he's done from anything from Sanford and Son, like you mentioned, to The Wiz, to The Color Purple. Um, I mean, but he did Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice back in the day. Uh, I mean, he, he's, he's never been pigeonholed into one area. I mean, he worked with Leslie Gore. and It's my, it's my party. He produced that for Leslie Gore. And if you don't know what it is, just Google, it's my party. It's the, it's the most, well, I'm not going to say it's the most pop thing, because Michael Jackson would be the most pop thing. But 1963, it's my party was pretty white. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how else to say it. It, it was just a, it's my party. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, Frank Sinatra. I mean, who, who if, if it wasn't on your resume that you worked with Quincy Jones in some form or fashion, then you, some people would have said that you just didn't do any music. Because, yeah. I mean, if, if you did something great, he had you in his stable at some point in time. So... Brothers Johnson. I mean, I think about so many people, man, who, who Q has kind of been around and has done his thing, man. So, like I said, mad respect for him. Um, just an amazing choice, Charles. I'm glad we had a chance to spotlight uh, Quincy Jones's career, who I affectionately call Q. All right. So, all right, Charles. Busy, busy week, man, of movies. Um, I'm not sure how many of these four you have seen, but I definitely wanted to uh, get at it and talk about some of these movies. Uh, first up, man, is a film that's a Netflix release, and it stars a very popular comedian who is doing a dramatic turn. And of course, that film is Fatherhood uh, from Kevin Hart. Um, I, I screened this film a couple of days ago and just rewatched it moments ago before we got on the air. Um, Fatherhood is a comedy drama directed by Peter, Paul Weitz from a screenplay by Weitz and Dana Stevens based on a 2011 memoir, Two Kisses for Maddie, a memoir of loss and love by Matt, Matthew Logalin. Film stars, of course, Kevin Hart, Alfre Woodard, Frankie R. Faison, Lil Rel Howery, DeWanda Wise, Anthony Carrigan, uh, a star turn from the very young and talented Melanie Hurd and Paul Reisner and follows a new father who struggles to raise his daughter after the sudden death of his wife. Um, I saw the, the, the trailer for this film, Charles, and I was like, OK, you know, here's another comedian uh, taking a dramatic role. And I'm, I'm not saying that to be critical because, you know, what I've discovered is you watch Will Smith for years do The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and then we see The Pursuit of Happiness and so many of the other dramas that he's made. Um, Jamie Foxx, of course, was, uh, was doing the Jamie Foxx show in the 90s. A decade later, he plays Ray Charles, wins an Oscar, and he, he never looks back. His career just takes off. Uh, and on and on and on, we've seen uh, folks, to a certain effect, uh, Chris Rock, who is a guy who made a lot of uh, comedy films. Later on, to me, his his breakthrough as an actor came on television when he did Fargo. I'm thinking that's the best thing I've seen Rock do 
to kind of show his dramatic range. And here's Kevin Hart now. So Hart has made a career of doing a, a lot of these kind of films that spotlight how short he is and, you know, the, the awkward nature of, 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 of his kind of personality along, well, his size along with his bigger personality. Um, he's tried to make some, some films that were, you know, were some more serious, dramatic films in the past. I would say the um, remake of The Untouchables that they did, I forget what it was called, Upside Down, uh, whatever. The Upside. The Upside, yeah, Upside. It was Upside Down to me because I love The Untouchables. And you messed up my movie. So I, I was like, okay, I'm dead. okay, that one was okay. But let me tell you something. This film here, Kevin Hart commits to this character. And of course, as I said earlier, here's a man whose wife has a baby and like the following day has an, has an, emu, uh, how do you pronounce it? Embolism. Thank Embolism. you. And dies. And he is left to raise his baby alone uh, in an environment with, uh, you know, a mother and a mother-in-law and nobody feels that he can get it done, but he's determined to do it for his wife. And the film kind of, you know, based on 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 this real memoir, this story uh, written by a man who was not African-American. Hart takes the story and along with the brilliant Melody Hurd, uh, who plays Maddie in the film. It, it reminds me of when you talk about a talented young actress or a talented young lady or young girl, you want to call her. It reminds me last year when we saw um, the, the Christmas film. Um, Jingle Jangle. Thank you. Jingle Jangle Christmas Journey. And young, I think her name was it was it Madeline, not Madeline Woods, um, Madeline Mills the young girl in that film, who I thought was absolutely brilliant. That's what Melanie Hurd reminds me. She's this year's Madeline Mills, who, for this story to really work, you not just need a father who can deliver, but you need a child and a father who can play off one another. And Hurd and Hart are great in this movie. Um, Alfred Woodard, of course, plays the mother-in-law whose daughter is the one who's gone and feels some sort of way about uh, this man who she's not really a big fan of trying to raise her her granddaughter. Frankie Faison is the husband who's sort of kind of there to balance it out. Um, I think, you know, there was a lot to like about this film. And I think for me, the fact that um, I'm one of, of, of millions of Americans who does not, who will not have a father on Father's Day, these movies sort of touch me in kind of a, a, a sweet spot. And I enjoyed this movie immensely, man. I, I watched it the first time and I said, you know what, this is a really good look for Hart. He's tried to do the dramatic thing before. I think this is really the first time that he's actually hit it. And I think what also makes this performance to me by Hart even much better is that we've given him some time and Hart is now raising a young daughter. I think his daughter's name is Heaven. It may not be the same age. Huh? No, Kevin Hart's real life daughter is named Heaven. Thank you, producer off the side. I'm here. Maddie. Uh, so the fact that Hart has his own daughter that he's raising, I think a lot of, of what we see in the film is not necessarily his real life relationship, but the, the, the way he relates to her probably is some of the stuff that he picked up from relating to his own daughter. Um, I just, I like this movie a lot, man. Matter of fact, I'm going to give it a B plus, Charles. I really liked uh, Fatherhood, and I think it was an absolute, an absolute good look for, for Hart, and it further expands in his acting what he wants to do, because like I said earlier, he tried in the past to do dramatic stuff. I'm like, yeah, I'm not really believing you. He got me on the hook in Fatherhood. What about you? I I feel the same way pretty much. I think that, uh, like you said, the upside was was not very good and a very disappointing remake of a, a great film. Um, so when we get fatherhood, I'm I'm going in with a little tenseness because I don't want to see something bad. But I think because this is not a remake, we don't have a, a, a any former or prior knowledge of this film or what it should be look like. He, he has a little freedom here to play this role. And uh, just a father and a daughter, it's the story between a father and a daughter, there's that special, if it had been a father and a son, it just wouldn't have worked. But this is a father and a daughter. 
after the tragic death of his wife. And I think I think Kevin Hart really does a very good job. Uh, uh, we should give credit to Paul Weitz, who also uh, directed yeah. uh, 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 Chris Rock and Down to Earth, and so he did uh, Hugh Grant and About a Boy. Uh, so there's some he's got had some work in taking these comedians and giving them some 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 depth. So uh, I I think he's done a great job here. I don't know if I'm giving it a B plus. I would probably stick with a straight B because there was there were some things that were kind of hokey. And I, I, as a father of a daughter, it, it, it kind of was like, come on now, come on now. So well, uh, the little Row Howry stuff, man, I didn't get that at all, man. Like no. this dude just had no filter. Like, you know, let me tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but, but uh, I, I like but this again, movie, man. But again, Melody heard kind of steals this movie she's just i mean adorable and loving and powerful standing up against uh kevin hart's character i mean she she just uh, i am i was impressed by her work just i mean you hit the nail right on the head when you said uh madeline mills um i think her because she's not the main character in, like madeline mills was in that movie it was all i mean the movie was named after her but she is that that co-star that he needed to be successful in this film. Okay. And, and let's also clarify that you said, uh, that is his name, Paul White's the director. Yeah. Uh, down to earth was not a good movie. Uh, you, you wasted Oscar winner, Regina King. Wow. <laughs> that was not a good movie. And, uh, down to earth, down to earth was a remake of heaven can wait. Uh, right. the, the, right. the, the infamous film from like that had been remade. That's like the third version of it. And about a boy was, was, was better. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, the third time's a charm or the, 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 out of the three films we're talking about, I think this one is the one to me that kind of resonates the best. So let's move on to our next film. And, um, you already see my face. Look, uh, whoever whoever's in the title department, um, the fact that we had the first film was called The Hitman's Bodyguard, and now we have The Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard. Okay, I I'll play along. Uh, this is the film, the sequel, uh, directed by Patrick Hughes, written by Tom O'Connor and Braden. Oh, excuse me, Brandon and Philip Murphy. It's a sequel, as I said, to The Hitman's Bodyguard and features the big three back together again. Ryan Reynolds, Samuel L. Jackson, Salma Hayek, and Richard E. Grant reprising their roles with Frank Grillo, Tom Hopper, Antonio Banderas, and Morgan Freeman joining the cast. And if you've seen the original Hitman's Bodyguard, I thought it was actually fun. A story about uh, a hitman played by Samuel L. Jackson and a bodyguard who the two of them have an unfortunate crossing and then they spend the movie kind of siping at each other. And then we have a scene toward the middle to the third act of the film where you find out that uh, Sam Jackson is married to uh, this stunning uh, Latina, uh, <laughs> Salma Hayek. And now what we've done is they're like, okay, when we come back with a sequel, we have to give her a, a larger role, hence the hitman's wife's bodyguard. Right. Oh, my God. So this movie starts off with uh, uh, Ryan Reynolds, who is this decorated bodyguard, one of the best in the game, who has, 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 is in therapy right now. He's dealing with a lot of stuff. He's trying to get out the game, trying not to use the skills that he has learned. Uh Samuel L. Jackson's character is being held hostage and being tortured. And suddenly, as Ryan Reynolds is trying to relax and get out and get his mind on other things, he gets tapped on the shoulder. There's a there's a very humorous montage that goes on as he's sitting at a on the at a resort and he's got on a head a headset similar to what I'm looking to list. I mean that what I'm wearing, listening to some music that's really soothing and relaxing. And behind him, we see People just getting shot up. He's totally oblivious and and only to discover that Salma Hayek is coming for him because she wants him to help her rescue her husband. 
which of course they do. And then the three of these guys go off on another crazy adventure. Salma Hayek, I, I, I know she loved this role because she got to swear and act like a, a guy <laughs> with a potty mouth. I mean, some of it was funny, but I'm like, damn. <laughs> um, the hitman's bodyguard's wife as a film might be entertaining to watch. As a film with, with an actual plot, it's an absolute mess. Uh, Morgan Freeman shows up in the movie in, in a role that you're like, come on, man, really? Uh, <laughs> Frank Grillo is there doing kind of, you know, doing what he has to do, bringing what he brings to the story. Ah, it's a movie that I, it made me laugh while I was there. Uh, the further I have gotten away from that film, I'm like, <laughs> I'm not even I'm not even gonna say the old line because I would get in trouble, but it was one of those films that I saw and it and it was cool for a moment, but you know, a week and a half later, you're like, yeah, you know, it's forgettable. It'll it'll come and it'll go. You'll go and watch it this weekend and a month from now, I'd be like, Hitman's bodyguards, uh, Hitman's wife's bodyguards, you'd be like, What? Huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> uh for me, C minus on the hitman's wife's bodyguard. Um, like I said, I, I was entertained while I was there, but it ain't a lot there. This is a messy, messy movie. And unfortunately, we're probably going to get the hitman's wife's uh, girlfriend's bodyguard or bodyguard's girlfriend. Yeah, something and coming up in part three, because if it makes money, they'll be back with more of them. Um, so I was not a huge fan of this film. Charles Kirkland, Please save us and tell me, tell the audience that Tim is tripping and that this movie, this is the goodest movie, not a word, <laughs> the goodest movie that's out in theaters this weekend. Um, you know, the hitman's wife, the hitman's bodyguard, when Salma <laughs> Hayek came on the screen in that movie, she was just so out of character, you know, because it, it was in that film that she cussed and I mean was violent and all that stuff and so it was really took us by surprise to see this so when we come back for the hitman's bodyguard wife's bodyguard it's it's a one-trick pony they're just recycling off of that same joke that happened in the first movie and it really it really didn't work for the whole movie I, I mean it was I mean like you said for the moment you're in there oh it's, it's a lot of fun you laugh you, you, you see the action and and you enjoy it, but now free guy is coming. Let's see how that does for Ryan Reynolds. Uh, this one is a pass. This is a pass for me. Uh, don't go see this movie. All right. Okay. Well, that's good. Let's let's keep it moving, man. Because we got movies, man. The next one up, man, is one that I had a chance to see a couple of days ago, and I, I desperately wanted to talk about this. It was the documentary Rita Moreno, just a girl who decided to go for it. Um, this is a documentary that's directed, produced, and edited by uh, Mariam Perez Riera, uh, and it follows Rita Moreno, focusing on her early life and career, uh, Norman Lear, Lynn manuel Miranda, Michael Cantor serve as executive producers. Man, let's jump right into this, man. This film um, had a lot of parallels. Her life and story reminded me a lot of the life story of one Sidney Poitier. And you would go, well, Tim, where are you getting Sidney Poitier with Rita Moreno? Well, easy. Sidney Poitier in 1950 made his debut in a film called No Way Out and became the first black man to be a leading man, which i.e. for people who are watching this who are really young and don't understand what leading man means, is that prior to 1950, if people like Lena Horn or say Paul Robeson or other African-American actors were in films, when those films played in parts of the country, i.e. the South, they could easily, they had it arranged where they could cut them out of these movies and kind of re-edit them. When Poitier comes along in 1950, that's no longer able to be done because it's a Sydney Poitier film. So Blackboard Jungle, Edge of the City, all these other legendary films in the 1950s, going into the 60s, Raising in the Sun, his Oscar-winning role in uh, Lilies of the Field, and on and on and on. Great year, 1967, In the Heat of the Night, uh, To Serve with Love, Guess Who's Coming to Dennis? So I just wanted to get that out, that that's the Poitier piece. Now, for Moreno, 
Her first film also was 1950, where Portier was a was a black man. Rita Moreno was a uh, uh, we now call a Latinx or a Latina, but a, a Hispanic woman breaking through in Hollywood at that point, who was a very, very beautiful actress. And I think the interesting thing about listening to her story coming from her own mouth was the amount of abuse and racism and sexism and misogyny that she had to deal with uh, coming up. There's a, a an amazing exchange with Harry Cohen, who I think, and I could be wrong, I have to check. Harry Cohen, I think, was either the head of Kidding, he wasn't a Warner, so it wasn't Warner Brothers. He had to be the head of Fox that told her, you know, she talked about she was, he was a crude little man. And what he asked her, I can't even repeat it on our show because I can't use that language. Um, she talks about how her she had a manager who literally raped her. And she said she thought so little of herself that she didn't even fire the guy. He raped her and she kept him as her manager. Um, she talked about. Uh, you know, her and Marlon Brando were in an off and on, off, off and on love affair for seven years. And she was so smitten with Brando that after he emotionally abused her and was seeing other women that she knew about, she literally tried to kill herself. I mean, so Rita Marino's story and what she had to overcome to become the first Hispanic EGOT. He got meaning she won an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. She would win her Oscar for West Side Story, which came out in 1961. That was a revolutionary film for, for that community in that time, right? So you think about her winning an Oscar in 61, Portier winning an Oscar in 63. You think about the doors that they kicked in with films like West Side Story, which came out the same year that you heard me say earlier, Raisin in the Sun. So there are lots of parallels, man. She would later uh, leave movies because they offered her all these roles that she said either she had to be a sexy vamp uh, or, or immigrant or a foreigner, or she had to have an accent. And a lot of times she had to have both. Uh, tells the story, Charles, of one time being on the set of a movie where she had a death scene that was her and the rocks on the water. And there was an influx of jellyfish that were stinging her as she was trying to lay dying. And the director berated her, disrespected her in front of the entire cast. So there's stories after stories of not just her personal triumphs, her personal tragedies, but how she overcame them to later end up on Electric Company with Morgan Freeman and, and you know, and then the Muppets where she won Emmys um, and, and Grammys. I mean, so Moreno is as inspirational for her people being Hispanics, Latinxes, as what Portier meant for people of color, for African-Americans, you know, who looked at him and, 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 and the way he, you know, had the path that he, pay, he paved for people who ended up later being the Louis Gossett Juniors, the Morgan Freemans, the Denzel Washingtons, the Howard Rollins, Lawrence Fishburne, Wesley Snipes, and on and on and on. All these guys stand on the shoulders of Sidney Poitier. You have an entire community of Latino actors that stand on the shoulders of one Rita Moreno. And this documentary I thought was absolutely fantastic. Um, like you said, man, for me, a B plus on this one again, I really, really enjoyed Rita Moreno, a woman who decided to go for it. And I would highly suggest people go and check that out to learn more about this iconic entertainer, actress, uh, you know, just an amazing individual. And, and at 89 years old, still around and kicking, still around and kicking. I think you know, the one thing that you, I mean, you highlighted how she's an icon for uh, Latin representation, but I think she's also an icon for women as well. I mean, I mean there was a lot of power that she brought to the, the, the Hispanic community. But she did a lot of empowering things for women in general as well. And uh, we we have we talked about Salma Hayek. Where would she be if it weren't for uh, uh, the the role that Rita Moreno play, played in prior years? So, I mean, it's, it's a very powerful documentary. Uh, I enjoyed it. I gave it an A minus. Uh, not a. I mean, 
I mean, what more can you ask for? The, sto- uh, the it's a hard watch. It's a hard uh, listen to at some point in that in that film. But again, it's about the journey from where she was to where she is. How how she overcame these obstacles that were constantly thrown her way. Great film, must see. All right, and our final film tonight is uh, from what I call. Uh, routinely the most consistent studio in all of Hollywood is Pixar. Um, outside of two Cars movies, Pixar to me has never made a bad movie, man. Pixar, you know, there's, there's life, death, and taxes in Pixar. Those <laughs> Pixar ain't going nowhere. They Whatever they do, whatever they touch, they decide they're going to make, it works. And this latest one is Luca. Uh, which is a coming of age story, fantasy comedy um, that is directed by, and let me, I don't want to butcher the guy's name, but I think it's pronounced Enrico Casarosa and his feature length directorial debut. Uh, this film is written by Jesse Andrews, Mike Jones, produced by Andrea Warren, starring the voice work of Jacob Tremblay, Jack Dylan Grazier, Emma Berman, Marco. I'm not going to mess your name up. I'm skipping your uh, name. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Maya Rudolph and Jim Gaffigan. And this tells a story of a young boy and his friend who are, would they be described as, they're not mermaids, but what are they? It's like sea creatures or some they, kind? Yeah, they never say exactly what they are. So I just say sea monsters because that's what. <laughs> so so, so you know that I had to ask you that because that was kind of clear. Like, what are they? But uh, there is the, I'll use sea creatures. You want to call them sea monsters. Who, uh, as long as they're in water, they are, they appear to be the sea creatures. But when they dry off, they appear to be like regular kids. And it's, you know, after uh, having a, a set of strict parents, uh, he decides him and his friend to make a break for it. And they go upon land and live as regular people. Uh, they meet a young girl who they befriend and these set of outcasts just run around uh, and hang out with a goal that they each want a, a, a Vesper, a scooter. And the only way to win one is they have to win a bicycle race. Uh, and there's an arrogant idiot. I don't even know who voices this character who, who, who wants, who, who's the, the arrogant guy is kind of the, the, the guy who is like the big man on campus who terrorizes everybody who tries to prevent them from, from uh, reaching their goal. I'm gonna make this one real easy for you. The first thing that jumped out at me when I watched this movie, I said, um, hmm, you made a movie that was a metaphor for passing, huh? So when they're in the water, they black. But when they come out the water, dry off and fit in, they assimilate with the people. That was that's what I got out of out of this film. Now, a colleague of mine who I will not name said that they got out the metaphor they got for watching the movie was like this was like an animated call me by your name because they thought that the Antonio. I, I said, I said, really, I didn't get that. I got, I got, it's all about passing, which is what Luca is all about. I mean, you can, you watch it for what it is. Charles, what did you get out of it? Am I, am I stretching that this is a film about passing at these people? Even at the end, when uh, you find out that the, 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 what is his grandmother goes, man, I come up here and do this all the time. I'm always passing. I'm always out here hanging out. Pixar is trying to interject racial politics into an animated film, and it went over all y'all heads, and none of y'all got it. You didn't get that. I, look, I said that this could there could be an extrapolation of races <laughs> going on here, but extrapolation. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's real. It's, you got to be real testy to see this. I think this movie is really. On, uh, on, as I call it, on a surface level, this, this movie. Is, Excuse me, Heather. This movie is closer. Am I? Am I? Is am I right here about this passing thing? This she's not. Is, she's like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Charles is like. Well, you know, you you can extrapolate. I, really? I mean, think. Okay, Charles. Think about the film again. I, I'm. 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 I'm gonna be quiet. Think about what happens in the film. You know, when they get water on them, they become like these sea creatures, right? But there's a, we don't want to live as sea creatures, so we want to 
We want to get out here, dry ourselves off so we can get along with everybody else. We want to assimilate with the people of this town. Because the people of this town don't like sea creatures. And when they see sea creatures, what do they try to do to them? They try to, they're killing them. They're killing them. They're killing them. Wow. So, hold on a second. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. How about, how about the fact that these sea monsters are better at the race than the, all these people who've been in the race all the time? Mm, wait a minute. What wait a second. The sea, creatures, the sea creatures are better? Okay. <laughs> Watch this. Okay. Tiger Woods. Uh, <laughs> we're we're always, always better. Right, right, right. We're, we're always better. <laughs> you got all these examples in history of, of how, the, you know, more proficient man than pixar pixar get ready to send me some nasty letters i'm like man don't get mad at me i'm watching the movie for what it is because i'm sitting there going hmm it's interesting sea monsters okay <laughs> <Come out there. laughs> and then at the end this makes it even so this is what makes it even worse at the end when the people decide what they are and that suddenly sea monsters aren't bad then what happens he still becomes a human boy and goes off to school somewhere. So, I mean, but, hey, but we still got some sea monsters in the town hanging out now. Now yeah. that now that being being a sea monster is kind of cool. So, so we don't have to pass anymore. We ain't got to pass. We can we can be who we are. <sighs> hey man, I'm just telling you, bro. I mean, you know, like I said, I think you're making the movie way deeper than what it really is. I mean, I mean, yes, you can say that. But this is this, this. If you want to look at, at it for that, this movie is for kids, and, and it, it doesn't speak to adults at all. It, it's it's a beautiful love letter to the Italian coast. But I mean, yeah, I mean, you can look at almost any movie and try to get get a little story, a theme out of it like that. But you know, my I, email address is filmgordon at gmail dot com. Send me all your <laughs> comments. I mean, tell me, am I wrong? Because, you know, like I said, you know, I, I extract I extract meanings out of a lot of movies. But, man, that was like, OK, maybe maybe Charles has a point that I'm, I'm maybe extrapolating. Maybe because it's Juneteenth that I'm in a heightened African-American freedom sort of a mood. But I didn't watch this movie on Juneteenth. I watched this movie last week. I was like passing. And then there is a movie. There is a movie coming out later this year, which is called Luca, a.k.a. Passing with Tessa Thompson and um, uh, Ruth Nega coming Ruth up Nega, a little later yeah. on this year. So that so when I go see that movie, I'm going to be like uh, one for one, two for Luca, please. They'd be like, Luca. Yeah, passing Luca. <laughs> <laughs> I gave I gave Luca. Uh, a B minus. I didn't like the way that, uh, you know, the, the, I, I don't like to inject these kinds of politics into my Pixar films. Uh, I'm just having fun. But no, but seriously, I mean, I'm laughing. But I did get that. That that was the big takeaway for me from watching Luca. Um, the, you know, always Pixar's uh, animation is always stellar. Their storytelling is stellar. Um, so Pixar can do no wrong. And as I said, outside of those two cars movies, which I'm not a big fan, Pixar has never made a bad movie and they still haven't made a bad movie, even though they're trying to hit me with politics while I'm watching my little animated stories, man. So Charles, what did you think about this movie? I, I wanted to give it a B, but I, I, I think I gave it a C plus. Um, the, for me, I thought the movie was very very much because like you said Pixar movies usually have multi layers you know to them and I thought this one was kind of flat in that and I mean there was that theme in it but it didn't really uh, give us any good message about it I mean it just looks like passion is cool but I mean other than that I mean so I couldn't really I couldn't really give it any better review than a C plus because it's I mean, it's just a plain movie. And I think in the, in the spectrum of Pixar, it's closer to Cars than it is to Soul. So wow. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, okay. that's how it was for me. Good point. All right, Charles. Well, we got to get out of here, man. It's a Juneteenth celebration. It's Juneteenth weekend. I uh, want to thank you guys for tuning in, man. You know, we will have Wilson Morales back and we'll have our normal crew because, as I said, we're – we're slowly but surely inching back. And at some point, we're going to make the announcement that we're going back in studio, which ought to be a lot of fun because uh, we haven't done a studio show since March of 2020. It's been a long time. 
But for now, man, as we tell you guys in closing every week, uh, please see something good at the movies. I, I used to feel strange saying that because I would be like, see something strange, see something good at home <laughs> on, on the streaming service. But you actually can go back to the movies now, uh, depending on where you live and where you're watching us. But until next time, that's episode 459, man. It is a wrap. Charles Kirkland, newfound member of the Critics' Choice Association. Tim Gordon, member of the CCA as well. So you got two CCA critics on him. We criticize the movies. We, we are part of the best of the best. And when we get Wilson back, it'll be three of us a part of the best of the best. So yeah. until next week, man, you guys enjoy. Enjoy your Juneteenth weekend. I have no idea of how to celebrate it yet. I guess I'll talk to my friends and family. You guys, Charles, you do the same thing. I'll see you guys on the other side. Until next week, man, we out. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you, too. I forgot all about that. We didn't mention that at all. Happy Father's Day. Take care. <laughs>